Thank you all for being here. I know some of you have been sort of flying overnight and made it to your panels on time, but I really appreciate your presence here. I think um, all of you have a copy of uh, the schedule and the agenda, and uh, with that, you have a note on what we hope to achieve from this panel, which is essentially to lay out uh, before us what are the kinds of issues, uh, what specific areas that need attention uh, over the next two days in our panels and our conversations. Um, you know, attacks are changing, evolving at different paces, taking different forms, and uh, whether it's government, civil society, uh, tech platforms, uh, there are different stakeholders who are looking at ways to combat what this violence means, what manifestations it takes, and what it, uh, what it does in terms of a larger radicalization that is taking place all around us. So we're trying to basically uh, analyze the changing nature of extremism, locate where these conversations are indeed taking place. Um, I'd like to actually just uh, ask, pose questions to each of the panelists, and we can take your opening remarks as part of that. The format is that we'll do a conversation on stage for about um, 30, 35 minutes, and then open it up to the audience for questions as well. And David, since you represent the umbrella body of uh, member states of the United Nations, uh, let me start with you. The UN Security Council set up the Counterterrorism Enforcement Directorate with a very clear mission in mind, um, but is faced every day with new challenges, whether it's different kinds of groups, different kinds of radicalization, different kinds of terrorism that are now coming into uh, popular discourse. How is the United Nations CVE policy and agenda adapting to changes? Um, well, it's, yeah, it's quite a big question to start off with, but yeah, first I'd like to just thank uh, Maya in, in particular, but also RF uh, in general for the invitation to be here uh, over the next two days, which having seen the agenda, I'm sure will be uh, a fascinating couple of days discussion. Um, so as you say, being part of, uh, of UNCTED it does mean that we get to engage with a really varied and I guess huge numbers of different stakeholders. So it was great to hear already about the importance of a multi-stakeholder approach. So that, that's sort of central to everything that, um, that CTED does. Obviously member states are who we uh, engage with primarily in terms of our assessment of, of how they're doing across all Security Council resolutions. But it is vitally important that we engage with the private sector, with uh, civil society organizations, and particularly the research community, which we do uh, through our global research network, of which uh, ORF is a member. So I think firstly, it's just uh, highlighting the importance of that multi-sectoral approach and the importance of engaging with people uh, at all levels, which again, we, we've heard about today. Um, part of what my team does, uh, the core part of what my team does is engaging on trends in, in terrorism, counterterrorism. As we've already heard, I think that the dynamics are shifting all of the time. And I think, as we've seen just over the last few days, the types of threats that member states are facing are also shifting as well. So um, a core part of what we do, and again, great to hear this already, is, is engaging with the research community so that we are across new threats and, and, and new types of challenges as they um, happen in real time. So you know, my team engages with research on, on a daily basis, and I think that's kind of central to what we do, and I think has to be central to, towards this evidence-based policy that everybody is striving for, but is, is very easy to say and very difficult to do, and I think the research community has to be central to that part, uh, to that approach, whether it is about identifying the challenges and whether it is about understanding um, how people are using the internet to spread ideology. But I think in terms of that broader approach, you know, two things that we really stress apart from the multi-sectoral side of things is both uh, the importance and centrality of human rights within uh, counterterrorism and, and CVE. And I think because it is multi-sectoral, that does make it challenging. We know it's challenging uh, for member states to, to make sure that their CT and CVE policies are human rights compliant. But when we're asking the private sector, we're essentially outsourcing to the private sector a, a massive role here in terms of what content uh, is allowed on their platforms. and. It's, it's a hugely challenging area, and I think human rights has to be central to that um, moving forward as well. So I think uh, that's, that's the interesting dilemma, and that's sort of really the, really the crux of 
the conversation between CT and CVE when it comes to sort of the protection of human rights, which you said the UN is, of course, interested in ensuring, and member states are also interested in ensuring. But let me just uh, dive in straight to the conversation. Saad Mohsini, I'd like to come to you, actually, uh, next, because one of the big conversations in the last year with the <coughs> fall of uh, ISIS in Mosul and uh, in, in Iraq and Syria has been what shape is terrorism taking next? What shape will violent extremism take next? Where will these fighters uh, move? And one of the concerns is that they're moving eastwards into countries like Afghanistan and maybe further east as well. Uh, we've seen what's happened in Afghanistan recently while people are on the campaign trail. Um, your thoughts? Well, I think that, <coughs> well, we may have defeated ISIS in Syria, but we haven't defeated the idea. Mm -hmm. uh, which is well and alive, and uh, it's quite extraordinary how, if you look at Afghanistan today, um, Al-Qaeda is making a return in northern Afghanistan. Uh, as a matter of fact, it's probably stronger than a lot of other uh, terrorist organizations in Afghanistan, northern, in, in a particular part of uh, northern Afghanistan. So uh, I think we shouldn't feel satisfied because we've, we've you know, we feel we've defeated Al-Qaeda as we thought we did in 2002 or 2003 in ISIS a couple of years ago. Um, the idea is far from defeated. As a matter of fact, it's finding new audiences. And in Afghanistan, it's what the challenge is that we have the educated uh, university student types who are attracted to the idea. We have uh, the sort of rural, um, farming types who feel under siege, who are not getting the basics in terms of justice, policing, and economic development, and they're attracted to the idea. And then you have opportunistic types who join Al-Qaeda or ISIS or the Taliban in order to earn an income. So we, we, and of course, the new challenge that we face today is social media in Afghanistan. More than a third of the population is now connected. So you're seeing the amplification of these uh, of, of these types of messages which, which attract uh, younger Afghans. And in, in a place like Afghanistan, which is the youngest country outside of Africa where the median age is 18, it's a real challenge for us. So unfortunately, it's not a very black and white situation. Um, any poll that you do uh, tells you that uh, the support groups like uh, the Taliban have is less than 10%. Mm. Um, so they're, they're not, they don't have uh, as far as support's concerned, it's not the masses that support them, but they're loud enough and violent enough uh, to, to be noticed and to be included. Today we're seeing discussions between the Americans and the Taliban in Doha, which could result potentially on some sort of a roadmap in terms of peace talks, but it's extraordinary that a group that uses violence that only has 10% support across the country can not only get a seat at the table, but could actually dictate the future of the country. Right, and I think that really is uh, one of the single biggest challenges uh, facing the entire world community right now and what happens uh, with this kind of peace deal with Afghanistan and how the negotiations will uh, play out and what that means for security in the region. The view from Delhi certainly is one of alarm and, and concern on that. Uh, Ramiro Martinez, let me come to you um, next because the peace deal is something that the U.S. is deeply uh, involved with as well. But just on the issue of the defeat of ISIS in quotes, I'm, I'm putting defeat in quotes, and moving to different territories, um, you know, how, how does U.S. CVE policy actually tie in with the need for um, an extremely vigilant security apparatus? We've seen conversations in the United States as well about whether CV is working, not working, what needs to be done, things like that. But this whole idea that there has to be a balance that's struck from your perspective. Yes, no, thank you. Thank you for the question and thank you to the uh, Observer Research Foundation uh, for in inviting me to participate in this, uh, what I'm sure will be a great event over the next two days. Uh, we at the State Department uh, in Washington focus on five key policy areas that kind of balance out what CV is. One is, which was already mentioned, is countering terrorist ideology. Even though the so-called uh, ISIS caliphate has been dismantled physically, the 
the extremist, the terrorist ideology that helped give rise to ISIS and other terrorist uh, organizations is still very much alive and being propagated uh, globally, and, uh, especially online among uh, youth. This is a long-term challenge. Um, second um, is we focus a lot on countering terrorist use of the internet, um, including social media platforms like Facebook, uh, Twitter, YouTube, Telegram. We have long believed that in order to counter this uh, hateful speech, we have to uh, use the alternative of, of positive speech. Um, third, we must increase our efforts uh, on community engagement. Uh, this means working with family members, uh, schools, uh, mothers, civil societies. We, we approach CVE from a very comprehensive, uh, holistic, whole of society approach. Um, we think that's especially needed right now. And then fourth is rehabilitation and reintegration. Um, there are thousands of foreign terrorist fighters or FTFs uh, in their families um, in, in partner custody in Syria. And the U.S. government is working very closely uh, with other governments to repatriate uh, these foreign terrorist fighters. Unfortunately, there's a lack of political will and, and quite frankly, capability um, uh, among these governments to, to take back their, their foreign terrorist fighters. But our argument is if they don't take back, if they don't repatriate their foreign terrorist fighters now, one day they could return freely and uh, inspire new followers uh, to commit ta uh, attacks of terrorism. And then fifth, um, certainly not, not least, but uh, we have to sharpen our focus uh, on the role of women, um, both as perpetrators and as victims uh, of, of terrorist acts. So that's, that's how we, we approach CVE at the State Department. Right, I think you've, you've raised some very interesting points about the lack of political will, especially when it comes to the question of foreign terrorist fighters, returning foreign terrorist fighters. This is uh, something Europe is certainly contending with. And Matteo, I'd like you to come in on this because, you know, when it comes to conversations on disarmament, rehabilitation, reintegration into society of such individuals, uh, you're actually coming straight to a very deep fault line. I mean, why should people who have pledged their life to violence uh, and extreme acts of violence based on ideology, religious, political, whatever ideology, why should they be brought back into the mainstream? And this is a challenge that your populations uh, are raising. They're asking the question. Yeah, sure. First of all, thank you for having me, Maya. And um, as you said, actually, I'm now working as a researcher for ESP in Italy, but I've been working for a couple of years with the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe, which is the largest security organization with uh, 57 member states. And um, from that perspective, with that experience, I had the chance to see how the international community, especially in Europe, uh, faces terrorist threats. And uh, first of all, the states need to uh, recognize the problem. Believe me, it's not something that happens automatically. Sometimes it takes years and then uh, states implement different, very different strategies. Uh, I mean that some states just focus on the repression and uh, persecution in the case of returnees, uh, the foreign fighters, and other states also implement the strategies of rehabilitation, disengagement, and uh, reintegration. This is something controversial in Europe because some states decided to um, put on the side um, the, the part of uh, uh, prosecution in case there is no evidence of crimes committed mm. by someone who um, traveled to uh, the, con the, the territory controlled by the Islamic State and um, just focus on rehabilitation and, reintegr and reintegration. This is something controversial because um, uh, sometimes there is no evidence of committed crimes but actually those individuals still uh, pose a threat to the community, they uh, come back. And in the current scenario, I basically see three main global insurgent ideologies we should uh, face. Of course, there are many forms of political violence and many different violent ide ideologies, but mm, some of them are uh, locally um, concentrated. And instead, the three main uh, ideologies we should uh, tackle are jihadism, in my opinion, 
far-right extremism and uh, anarchist environmental uh, extremism, which is something uh, that starts growing in these years, uh, especially in Europe and other countries. Uh, and from my experience with USC, what I saw is that um, some participating states started focusing on the role of civil society and local communities in countering extremism, and also the role of youth. Uh, the empowerment of youth in this is very important because uh, the, the phenomenon of radicalization, uh, especially, um, uh, is, is a, a youth phenomenon. So uh, the, the role of youth as a, uh, somebody um, that can help in countering this is very important. Right. Um, with that, Dina, let me come straight to you as well, because one of the conversations around CVE is this idea of multi-stakeholder. Right now, tech companies are the biggest, uh, uh, one of the biggest s stakeholders in the private sector um, that are in, yes, uh, the biggest in dealing with this. Now, just taking on from what, what Matteo said, one is the, the three insurgent ideologies that he's outlined that are challenges. But I think the big question of, again, the returning foreign terrorist fighters in countries like uh, Europe, um, the, the challenges that poses to, you know, to their integration within mainstream society, and the fact that people who are against these policies are using social media and social media platforms to, um, to post extreme hate as well. So it's one thing to say that the organization and uh, its users or members have no place on the platform, but what about the other side? And what about the sort of conversations that are actually quite vitriolic um, around it? That's one part of the question. The second is the, the counter-terrorism community, specifically the state-led counter-terrorism community, can often be quite um, cynical of this multi-stakeholder approach uh, on countering violent extremism. So your views on that as well. Um, we'll start off with thank you so much for having us. Obviously, it's it's excellent to be in a, sp in a space that discusses these topics that is not centered around uh, Western discourse of these issues because more, o more often than not, as, as, a, as a person from the Middle East who grew up in the Middle East, our communities are the, are the ones that are most <coughs> direly affected by this. So it's, it's always good to be in a room full of people who um, really understand the nuance and the, and the local context of these issues. Uh, so thank you so much, Maya, for having us. I think you make a very good point. As Anki stated, we, there is no place for, for terrorism on Facebook as a platform. There's also no place for hateful and vitriolic speech on the platform. Now, that comes with a little more of a gray zone because different groups define hate in different ways. Um, we'll see that even within legislature, uh, different states have different appetites for what they will and won't allow. Um, we see that in the US, maybe there's more of a leaning towards uh, free speech, but maybe in Europe, the, the trend is to be more protective of the, of, the, of the community in and of itself. So that, as a global platform to us, provides a little bit of a challenge because all of our policies apply globally. We do not selectively choose who gets the privilege of being protected by this policy or who gets the privilege of being protected by that policy. So that in and of itself is definitely a challenge. I do echo what David and what um, uh, Matteo have said around the importance of stakeholder engagements here. And as a stakeholder that is always being brought to the table to discuss this, because it is truly our platforms that, that this plays out on now, um, it's interesting to have a conversation around hate speech and terrorism when we lack the infrastructure of a, of a united definition. So this is something we face all of the time with, with terrorism, right? For, for us, for Facebook, we have openly defined terrorism. We've, we've defined hate organizations on our platform. You can go to our community standards and you'll find them. We're very open around that. Um, and so that's one step that we're taking towards towards moving forward in the right direction. Beyond that, we also work a lot with our communities, right? The reason why I'm here is because Anki and Kavita and Devika and our entire public policy team in the region are actively engaging with researchers like ORF, but also with our communities here, with civil society organizations that feed up what is the latest 
uh, discourse being used? How is hate speech being coded? So one of the things that we see, especially in regions where the language is so nuanced, is we need to keep up with what is the slang being used? How are you, the way that I would refer to somebody in a derogatory manner in Arabic, as an Egyptian, I would say it one way. As a Kuwaiti or a Khaliji, I would say it in another way. As a Syrian, I'd use a third dialect to, 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 to describe these things. So there's that aspect of it. So having teams that understand the local nuance is important. As far as the stakeholder engagement, I think one of the things that rightly so people are skeptical of is it's a, sometimes it's a lot of talk. As somebody who came from NGOs and, and somebody who is a researcher, you find that in a, lot of these, in a lot of these circles, people want to project the image that they're doing something and sometimes there's nothing to back it up. Yeah. But for us as Facebook, we really put a lot of effort into backing it up and it's come in the, in the form of GIFCT. So GIFCT has been our effort to bring together a cross industry effort that includes us at Facebook, it includes Twitter, YouTube, it also includes Microsoft as the founding four members of the Global Internet Forum to Counter Terrorism, GIFCT. Um, don't get me into the GIFs or the GIFs of the CT, <laughs> it is GIFCT. David and I may have had a conversation about this. Um, but so with GIFCT we have three different pillars that we work on. We work on joint knowledge sharing, we work on uh, technology sharing, and we work on research. Now, in the aftermath of Christchurch, we've actually pulled up another pillar, which is the crisis response protocol in and of itself. So to take you through quickly what that means, we, the first of those is the joint tech innovation. So we have, um, we have a, a meeting every month to talk about enforcement optimization. How is it that, that Facebook looks at uh, content moderation? What are, the, what are the things that we've learned? How can we help Twitter work on that? Um, we also have what is referred to as a hash sharing database. Now for those of you who might not know, for us a hash is a digital fingerprint where a piece of content is given a numeric value. So let's say there is a new ISIS Amaq video or a new Al-Qaeda propaganda video that comes out. We immediately take that content and we hash it, which means we give it a digital fingerprint. That numeric value is inputted into a shared database and we at Facebook have actually freely, freely licensed out the software that allows other and smaller tech companies to find that content on their platform and see if there's a match. So the one caveat there is this is not a hash data, it's not a database of the content itself, it's an identifier. So you can't go in there and reverse engineer, which is a big worry for governments, right? You have this big box full of terrorist content, you don't wanna have that. So we, are, we really, we've thought this through and we don't have that content, but we can help smaller tech companies identify it. Then we also work on um, the research aspect of it. So David had spoken about the research, net, the global research network that the UN yeah. has. We sort of maybe stole the global research network name. Um, but we have our own global research network on technology and terrorism, GRUNT, which is uh, an interesting acronym. Um, but Grunt is made up of eight institutes, which includes very proudly ORF, um, on four different continents that bring research that is, is engaging, is timely, is up to the task of bringing in newer topics. So we have seven papers out and you can find them on the GIFCT website. Um, so that's the research portion of it. We also, as we said, we have a joint knowledge sharing um, aspect of this work. And the knowledge sharing is built around doing e-learning sessions. Um, we also shared, to jump back a little, so we've shared at this point through the hash sharing database, over 2,000 hashes. So that's over 2,000 pieces of content that have been identified as being uh, terrorist content that other tech companies can use. But we've also advanced that. We've, we now share URLs. So we've shared over 9,000 URLs with other companies that said, okay, Facebook has found this content that leads to a Dropbox file we don't know what's on that, but hey, Dropbox, here's a creepy URL, you check it out. Um, so that's another thing. And to get back to the very last pillar, in the aftermath of Christchurch, we really partnered up with, with our partners in New Zealand. Um, law enforcement was the first to notify us when the content was on our platform, and we engaged very closely with them to make sure that not only did it come down, 
but because of the, uh, le the legislator and the laws in place at that time, we took down all of the content, the video content online that came along with that because it became illegal to share that content in New Zealand. And then through working with New Zealand, we really realized that there's a space for us to respond in a crisis as, as an industry. And so we put, put together what we refer to as the content incident protocol. So there's the crisis response, which is what happens when a crisis takes place, and that includes all of the stakeholders. And us at GIFCT have a content incident response, which means when we find that there is content with the potential of virality, like we saw at Christchurch, which was a horrific attack in and of itself, but then to see that played out as a, as a member of the Muslim community and as a, somebody whose father prays in these, in these spaces of worship, to see that then played out over and over and over again is a secondary horrific experience in, in and of itself. And so we came together as the four founding companies to say, how can we, how can we address this in a multi-stakeholder way? And so we are partnering up with other tech companies to have that information. So when governments flag to one of our companies that there is content online that has the potential to go viral, it's tied to a real world event and um, it's targeting civilians, then we all identify that content and we hash it. And there's an emergency response that allows us to all pull during the entire duration of that crisis from that hash sharing database so that all of the companies, even the smaller ones, that might not have law enforcement bilateral partnerships on the ground can pull from that database. So I think really to, to, to sum up what is a lot of different areas of work, we're trying to put a lot of structure in place behind these partnerships yeah. so that they last beyond the news cycle. And that's important. Right, so there's a couple of questions uh, for mm -hmm. Saad actually that that uh, I have based on Dina's comments. Mm -hmm. One is, I'd like you to come in as well on this idea mm -hmm. of the cynicism of the state with, uh, with multi-stakeholder approaches and stakeholders in the private sector. That's one part of it. The second is the sort of rift uh, between social media and mainstream media uh, and how that is playing out when it comes to violent extremism. Um, countries around the world are now faced with this challenge of how people get information. I know we have dedicated panels on misinformation and propaganda later in the course of the conference, but just your views from the you know, perspective of somebody who's running these TV stations in a conflict zone as well. Well, I think uh, Samir was right that we, we can't legislate against platforms and, and uh, outlets such as Facebook. Yeah, well, not quite yet, but <laughs> we have to acknowledge that um, Facebook and other social media outlets have been hugely responsible for some of the things that we've seen over the last three or four years, and they, they have to take a lot of responsibility for that. And some of these things cannot be reversed, um, whether it's with Brexit or the elections or just the rise of, uh, of, uh, of various forms of extremism. Uh, in theory, it sounds right that the government agency would inform them of a particular video and then they would uh, deal with it and, of course, be able to ban it, but we experience it in Afghanistan. We see videos of all types. And uh, just reaching Facebook is a difficult challenge for people like us, and we're the largest media organization, and we have outlets right across the Middle East and Africa. But imagine, you know, some small Afghan agency being able to reach Facebook. So in theory, it sounds great, but in reality, that's not the case. And Facebook is a multi-billion, you know, you know, worth hundreds of billions of dollars and generates a lot of money. Um, it has an interest, obviously, to manage these things, and it still cannot. Whether you know, some some would argue by design, some argue that it's just the, the problem is too big. But the issue that I think we have to understand is that that the fragmentation of the media has been has created a ser new series of challenges for us. Mm -hmm. In the old days, you would have the major broadcasters, uh, Durdashan in India, or in, in the U.S., you had three networks that you know, tens of millions of people would actually go flock to, to, to get the news. Nowadays, every single individual can find, that, find an outlet that pretty much echoes their views. And our worst instincts are being sort of, you know, fuel added to the fire by going to these, to these outlets. And I think we have to, we have to understand that uh, as much as we'd like to blame these outlets, and some of us do, it's inherent 
in, in many of our societies, the fears and the concerns that we have, whether it's in Europe with migration or their values coming under attack, or in Afghanistan as various other issues that we face on a daily basis, I think we have to sometimes, we have to actually address those issues as yeah. well. Um, why is it that a young migrant in a working class suburb of Paris doesn't feel French enough and has to then get radicalized? Or why is it that the, his neighbor, a white Frenchman, who sees his values under siege, he has to go to the other extreme? And I think these questions that need to be asked, and I think we have to take many steps back. Uh, look at our education system, uh, better integrating um, various groups in our societies, giving them an outlet. Uh, I think, you know, we talk about stakeholders, I and mean, a lot of young people in Afghanistan do not believe they're stakeholders in the process, so they get radicalized. Um, when you clamp down on legitimate political movements, like say in Egypt, there's only one place to go, which is um, to, to look to the Islamic or the Islamists, because they're the only outlets or they're the only movements that can survive and you know, under tough conditions like say we're seeing in Egypt. So it's a very complicated situation. I think we all have to work together, but I just, you know, it, it's a bit depressing actually when you look at the challenges uh, close up. Yeah, and I, I fully agree with, uh, with the point that you made that ultimately platforms are a place for amplification of what's actually already just happening in society. So if we don't address it at this level, it doesn't matter whether they have a platform or not, it's what's happening in their mind. But, but the human race, <laughs> as we've learned, yeah. that you, you, you get artificially, you know, artificial intelligence, you know, uh, fueled uh, uh, online entity can become racist within 28.3 nanoseconds. That's right. I think our worst instincts come out, that's why leadership is so important in our societies. Because I think if we leave it up to the masses, we're going to see the exact opposite of what we would like to see. So, Ramiro, yeah, you wanted to come yeah, in, but yeah, so on the leadership point as well. Comment. Well, I was going to uh, comment on this last point. This is yeah. a big issue for the State Department as well. Uh, we meet, we engage, and we meet regularly with uh, private tech companies uh, in the U.S. Um, our approach is voluntary collaboration and information sharing. Uh, we encourage tech companies to address. Uh, content on, online. Uh, while we feel that more can be done, uh, we think this is a good approach. Um, companies have become more proactive, more assertive in expanding and enforcing their, their terms of service. Um, but we also want to emphasize we don't want to risk uh, our response to this threat. Um, we don't want to risk open, secure, reliable internet. So, um, and we also don't want to be um, inconsistent uh, with our U.S. Constitution and Freedom of Expression Amendment, so big issue for us as well. All right, okay, thanks a lot for that uh, intervention. Uh, David and Matteo, I want you to come in on something that Dina actually uh, was talking about earlier, which is uh, the need for definition of terrorism, of hate speech, of violent extremism. Um, top down from the U.N., how hard is this, David? I mean, yeah, I, I think it's, it's obviously been a problem for a long time, and I, I can't see any likelihood of getting anything uh, universally agreed as a definition for these issues. So, yeah, I, mean, I think we can see that Facebook's approach has been, has been to say, well, we will come up with our own definition, and I know, I know that's not an approach that all of the big tech platforms have taken, but even when Facebook did, I know there was some criticism around what was included and what wasn't included. So trying to do that with 193 member states, given all of the politics involved, it, it is essentially an impossibility. So I think that the definitional issue is, is one that is gonna remain. Um, and I think that is very important for the UN and I think for other multilateral organizations because it does, groups like ISIL and Al-Qaeda, you can have a general sort of coalition around, this is a, a common problem that is faced by so many member states around the world that we have to do something about it. But I think with some of the emerging threats that we're going to see we don't em envisage that we'll have the same amount of consensus around how we define the problem, how we articulate the problem, how we respond to the problem. And I think that is going to be a, a challenge moving forward as we see challenges to multilateralism more broadly reaching any sort of consensus around some of these new types of threats um, is, is going to be very, very difficult. 
Right, Mathieu, you uh, can come in here. You, you talked about already, you know, the three kinds of global insurgent ideologies and the Christchurch call to action was a response to not just one of them, but all of them and the use of technology as well. Now, given this issue of definitions and how hard it is, I want you to come in on that aspect of it, but also on you know, what we are looking at in terms of a, a geopolitical sort of drift. Uh, 17 countries have signed on to the Christchurch call of action. You'd think that there would be many more interested in, in sort of countering violent extremism. Member states, I mean, David is talking about getting 193 countries together, but 17 is barely a fraction. And, and Europe is seeing a lot of this split as well in terms of, you know, individual nation states and their politics. Yeah, actually, uh, the, the issue of definition is something very important to also in the U.S.C. because um, the lack of a consensus on the definition of what terrorism is, what extremism or violent extremism is, allows certain countries to label opposition organizations and movements or groups as terrorists and just criminalize them. But uh, I want to go back to your, to your question about the uh, current geopolitical drifts uh, that, in my opinion, includes a wave of alt-right parties and leaders ruling in key states in Europe and also in, the, in North America. And we cannot effectively respond violent extremist uh, ideologies without raising awareness on far-right neo-fascist nationalist terrorism, call it how you want. But let me remind you a short timeline of what uh, happened in the last decade. 2011, Anders Breivik killed 77 people in Oslo and Utoya, mm. blaming multiculturalism and ethnic replacement. Uh, 2016, the Labour MP in Britain, Joe Cox, was killed by a neo-fascist militant uh, in 2017, what happened in Charlottesville, U.S., uh, James Field, an American neo-Nazi, uh, basically was participating in this white supremacist rally and uh, ran over peaceful protesters, killing one. In that occasion, President Trump commented on the rally and uh, the protest, saying that there were, and I quote, very fine people on both sides. In 2018, um, in Italy, uh, the far-right extremist uh, Luca Traini, who was actually also running for local election in the ruling party, Lega, in Italy, uh, was sentenced to 12 years in jail because he sh was uh, shooting and wounding so uh, six Africans motivated by racial hatred against the migrants' invasion. So uh, we also had in the U.S. other cases of the attacks on the synagogues um, and of course, this year, the Christchurch mosques attack. And um, actually, um, Brenton Tarrant, the attacker in New Zealand, was inspired, among others, by the Italian attacker, Luca Traini, in Italy. Uh, we also had other, other cases, the, the murder of the uh, Polish mayor of Gdansk in Poland, and uh, what happened this year also about the, uh, of course, the El Paso shooting, the killing of the German politician, uh, Walter Lubke, who was in favor of uh, integration and uh, uh, pro-migrant policies. Uh, actually, the US and some European far-right governments uh, are underestimating the terrorist threats from uh, neo-Nazi neo and fringes. And what I want to draw attention on is that, uh, of course, far right is not an organization like ISIS or Al Qaeda, but it's for sure a movement with a consolidated ideology. And the fact that one attacker is taking inspiration from the previous ones proves that. Actually, uh, the attacker of El Paso uh, took inspiration from the Christchurch attack. So there is this sort of uh, connection between one and each other, and the platform they used to uh, publish their manifesto, their thoughts, this uh, 8chan platform, was actually, uh, is still actually one of the main uh, places for far-right uh, militants to share their uh, hate and uh, their ideas. But in my opinion, taking it down wouldn't solve the problem because 
the user would simply go to move to another platform or to another uh, website. The point is, is this platform and the other websites uh, effectively monitored by the intelligence community? Uh, in the case of the El Paso shooting, President Trump defined, uh, defined it uh, an act of cowardice. I don't think this is, was an act of cowardice. This was an act of terrorism. And we, we should call it uh, for what it is. So um, I'm wondering what not just the US administration, but also the other uh, governments, in, in some cases far-right governments, uh, what has to happen before these governments treat uh, white supremacists as terrorists and not like a mental illness? Uh, in some cases, they are defining these attackers in uh, cases of mental illness. It's an ideology encouraged by certain politicians and propaganda, and the first step to achieve a global strategy uh, to tackle insurgent ideologies, in my opinion, is uh, stop to foster a hateful narrative about invasion of migrants and about, about ethnic uh, replacement and ethnic uh, clashes. Uh, Dina, let me just uh, bring you in on, on this because, you know, one of the issues in talking about uh, the challenges that Matteo was referring to is that certainly in the years since 9-11, the conversations around terrorism have been about a particular ideology, a particular group, whether it's Al-Qaeda or subsequently ISIS, and uh, the, the idea of a global Islamist jihad, which continues to be a significant uh, threat. Now, this idea that one feeds the other, if, if other attackers on the far right took inspiration from Christchurch, the Easter bombers in Sri Lanka said that was retaliation uh, against Christchurch as well. So one thing is kind of feeding the other. But why is there a resistance uh, to accepting that there are other kinds of extremist ideologies today which are becoming a challenge as well. Just acknowledging that doesn't negate the, the challenge that the global jihad still faces, but the, the, the resistance seems to be coming from the fact that, you know, attention can't be split. Way to go easy on the question. Yeah, that's really, my job. Way to go easy on the <laughs> When it, came, when it came to, to extremist jihadist terrorism, and I think our, our uh, rhetoric around this, need, we need to be very careful around the, the terminology we use because that's one of the things that leads to this gray area where people are more comfortable labeling extremist jihadists as, as the threat that we have to address. I think because there was such a consensus around the targeting of civilians and the methodology by which um, extremists jihadists utilize uh, violence in order to attack their victims. It's a threshold of savagery and violence that we're all comfortable accepting as, yes, that's violating of all of our ethical standards. But then what happens when it is maybe somebody who is doing this in coded language that is a gray zone? And that's what we face, to be very honest, with the threat from um, extreme right-wing nationalists or separatists that are trying to, um, or let's say white separatists in, in, for Facebook, that's something that violates on our platform. But the discussion in order to get there was a challenge, like you mentioned, because there is a hesitancy to address this. I think part of it, to be very honest, is tied to the fact that historically there has been a group, the Nazi party, that was very violent, and we've all come to a consensus that that was that, that that was something that we found to be horrific. But then since then, you see that the methods utilized by extreme right wing um, violent actors are a lot more coded. There's a lot more of an awareness of where are the lines. For an, extreme, an extremist jihadist, the point is to make noise. The point is to eventually die in, uh, if you're an extremist jihadist in, for the cause. And, and the idea is you want to draw attention to what you're doing in a way that outsiders also acknowledge it. It's not, it does not play the same way for, for extreme right wing. There's a lot of in, in conversations, there's a lot of coded language. And as a result, there's a hesitancy to label, um, to, to label because there's some people that will say, no, this is fully within my rights, I'm not being violent. 
Um, so I think we're coming to more and more of a consensus when it comes to extreme right wing violent actors. Now, once we enter into nonviolent rhetoric, that's where I think we need to, and also as somebody that formerly worked for NGOs and worked for governments and is now working in the private sector, I don't think it's the, we, I don't think we want the private sector to start defining hmm. what rhetoric is correct and incorrect. Hmm. Right, okay. Yeah, yeah, go ahead, David. Yeah, yeah I, mean, I think this is, yeah, I think Dean, Dean makes some really interesting nuanced points and I think quite apart from the, the political dynamics of this question, there is just a, there has to be a recognition that we are dealing with a movement that is, that has some similarities, but I think we need to recognize the differences and I think particularly in the last few days after what happened last week in the US, there has been this fresh to say, well, we should treat it in exactly the way, the same way that we treat groups like ISIL and Al-Qaeda and their supporters. And I think Dean has highlighted some of the ways in which the way they communicate with each other online are, are very clearly different. And so it's, it's fine to have a hash database for specific items of propaganda, but when we're talking about memes and GIFs that are changing and evolving on a daily basis, how you police that from a, on, an online perspective is obviously very challenging. But I think also from an international perspective, trying to overlay a, an approach we've used for groups that are hierarchical, are structured, have mm -hmm. names and labels and roles. And are easier to identify. It's very, mm -hmm. you know, it, and I think from the UN point of view, we can talk about designation and we can talk about asset freeze and we can talk about very uh, legal responses to a, a structured group. And I think mm -hmm. a lot of governments are great at bureaucratic mirroring and having this group structure that we can recognize and identify. I think when we're looking at a movement that is a lot more amorphous in the way that the extreme right wing uh, is, it, it is gonna be a fundamental challenge quite apart from the political will just to understand how you approach a movement that operates in this leaderless way with a kind of online community that's driving offline action. So I, I think there are a lot of areas I'm really interested to hear over the next couple of days where it will be very bad to replicate the approach that we've been taking. Ramiro, in fact, maybe you can also come in on this because in the last week we're seeing reports out of the US particularly about how the FBI is once again looking at its domestic terrorism um, di division and, and sort of trying to revamp that. Uh, you know, come in on that and also this idea that there has been a resistance uh, or a refu uh, an unwillingness perhaps to accept this as a real threat as well because the notion is that accepting another kind of terrorist threat apart from a global jihad terrorist threat uh, will undermine the attention that's given to one. Is that really the case? Well, first of all, we have a challenge uh, in the United States on terminology. Um, there are different terms floating around. There's domestic terrorism, there's right-wing terrorism, but we at the State Department uh, have decided to call it racially motivated terrorism. Um, so as, as uh, Matias was saying earlier, uh, domestically the number of racially motivated terrorism um, uh, attacks has increased in recent years. Uh, in the United States especially, with an average of five attacks in 2007, rising to 14 attacks in 2012, 31 attacks in 2017, and more recent attacks last year and this year, of course. Um, I, also, I just want to note also that, as with other terrorist groups such as ISIS, radicalization and inspiration to carry out terrorism is increasingly taking place online as well. Um, so uh, while the U.S., from a, from a domestic uh, law enforcement perspective, the, the U.S. Federal Bureau of Investigation, or the FBI, cannot open investigations uh, solely on the basis of First Amendment protected activities. Um, and we feel that technology companies uh, must take voluntary action to address violations of their own community standards or terms of service. Um, in terms of our local uh, uh, federal government institution that addresses this issue, specifically it's the de uh, Department of Homeland Security, or DHS. Um, their role is to collect and share information on acts of racially motiva motivated terrorism and to support efforts to prevent acts of this terrorism. Uh, what the State Department does on this issue and how we address this issue is that we monitor and we assess domestic groups that we feel have international uh, ties or ambitions. We also track instances of what we've seen recently as what we call the feedback loop. That's one, um, and a terrorist attack abroad might inspire, there's evidence that it has inspired terrorist attacks 
uh, domestically. So we share that information um, with, with, uh, with the US uh, law enforcement, DHS, FBI, Department of Justice. Uh, and then we examine the extent to which uh, racially motivated terrorist organizations are learning or mirroring uh, tactics and approach from global uh, Islamist terrorist groups and other terrorist groups. So that's, that's how we address uh, the issue of racially uh, motivated terrorism. Mm -hmm. Before I open it up to audience questions, Saad Mosaini, just come in on this as well, because Afghanistan is a place where right-wing extremism and the jihad kind of converge as well, right? Yes, well, it's, it becomes a vehicle for many, many types, as we're seeing in the West. I mean, the extreme left is also attracted to some of the, some of the threats that we're seeing uh, in some of the Western countries. It sort of mirrors the challenge that Europe faced in the 1920s. Um, and today, the extreme right-wing parties are attracting a lot of working class, uh, blue-collar uh, types of voters. Uh, so it's, it's not as clearly defined as it used to be. But in Afghanistan, like, you know, like we're seeing, it could be ideology, it could be lack of opportunity, it's the fact that they don't feel included, it could be many different factors. And I think that in different countries, we have different challenges. That's why it's so difficult to reach consensus at a yeah. global level. And, and just as a quick follow-up to that, in terms of the access to technology, and when I say technology, it's quite apart from just you know social media and the internet and things like that, but actual you know technology that's made accessible, whether it comes to drones to use, uh, drones in terror strikes, whether it, things like that, um, is that a serious concern in Afghanistan? Is, is it a serious concern for the entire uh, counterterrorism community and the the ease yeah, of access, they, weapons because, technology. Well, not just ease, it's just they're just so good at it. They're so, you know, they can adapt so quickly. Uh, mm. I remember years ago when, you know, WhatsApp and other, you know, uh, apps were available, uh, terrorist organizations were much better in terms of exchanging videos and messages. Uh, and that continues. And they're always one step ahead of the, the, rest of us. the regulators and the police yeah. and the governments. And that's why it's so important for the outlets, whether it's Facebook or us or others, that we have to self-regulate. You know, and we still we have our own challenges, whether it's freedom of expression or just you know lack of capacity in, in order to make it happen. Right. Okay. I'm gonna. We have about 18 minutes left. I'm gonna open this up to questions from the audience. Uh, if you could just raise your hands, and we'll get a mic across to you. Um, we have one right here in the front. One, two. Three. We'll take these three first, and then we'll come to the back. Yeah. Um, thank you very much. Uh, it has been extremely um, thought-provoking. I'm Zani uh, from UK. Um, I want to um, ask a very uh, respectfully uh, some of the questions that you know uh, were raised in my head uh, listening to uh, the panel. Um, one was the. Um, the Facebook and the technology and then the call for self-regulation versus uh, you know, the governmental le legislation or UN involvement. I mean, technology is like a gun or um, a knife. A knife can be used to save life if it is in the hands of a surgeon. And it, if it is in the hands of a butcher, it can give you food. If it is in the hands of a murderer, it will cause death. So we wouldn't expect guns or knives to self-regulate themselves, you know, whether it's the manufacturers or the handler. So why should we expect Facebook or other tech platform companies to be able to self-regulate and, uh, you know, uh, and expect that uh, there will be um, societal benefits incurring from it? I mean, with respect to Facebook and um, its you know, I wouldn't say complicity, it's failure to respond to the case of uh, Burma, where Facebook uh, had global headlines, was singled out by the United Nations uh, for its failure for the last uh, basically six years to respond to a situation that amounts to genocide. Yeah. Um, but the other one is the, um, uh, uh, Mr. Saeed, um, Saeed, your question, I mean, your issue about you know, don't leave it to the masses, the leaders are important. But what if leaders become the uh, demagogues themselves? 
who propagate uh, hatred, racism, Islamophobia, and, and all kinds of extremist ideology. I mean, like, you know, in my country of Burma, uh, leaders are deeply involved in propagating hatred towards Muslims, and particularly towards uh, Rohingya. And in the case of the United States, we've got uh, Donald Trump. I need to say, uh, I don't need to say anything more. And then the other assumption that comes out of, uh, uh, that, that seems to run through the conversation here is that uh, we look at um, non-state actors as propagators of hatred, racism, anti-multiculturalism, whatnot. But what if the state that we s treat a priori as a moral entity themselves propagate uh, hatred, racism, and genocidal ideologies in the way the, the Third Reich had done with massive uh, consequences. And finally, um, you want to save some questions for the next panel as well? We've <laughs> yeah, got lots sorry. of other people to, <laughs> to get yeah, the mic uh, to. Yeah, uh, on the terrorism. <laughs> I think we need to start um, redefining terrorism very seriously because, uh, Dina, you said, uh, you know, the terrorists uh, target civilians. Yes, uh, this is not to condone, you know, targeting civilians. But if you look at statistically, all the wars since Second World War, the greatest casualties of quote unquote, just and legitimate state sponsor of wars and self-defense results in the greatest number of uh, civilian casualties. So one deliberately targets civilians, and the other does not target civilian, but leave massive number of civilians dead, women and children mostly. Thank you. OK. All right. Um, General Mehta, you had uh, the mic. You wanted the microphone here. Yeah, thank you. And uh, may I also add uh, to what the gentleman before me has said, uh, my compliments to this panel. Uh, I have two questions, and uh, I'll be soft on Facebook, unlike uh, the gentleman before me. Um, I last heard that you have something in the region of a uh, couple of hundred who take down offensive material, um, and in relation to automation, uh, what progress have you been able to make? You talked about uh, fingerprints. Uh, could you uh, uh, explain that? Uh, my other question is to David on the, uh, the, the new counterterrorism office that was opened in uh, the United Nations. I uh, heard two of your gentlemen speak in, tele in Israel last year before last, and they were very despondent about uh, the kind of progress that the United Nations is able to make. And they call themselves merely facilitators. Um, and uh, they use slogans like, uh, we, must, uh, we must stop uh, talking, or rather walking the talk. Um, I want to know from you that in 2017, you had set up this prevent uh, policy as a slogan. So, because that I think... That was in the UK, I think. So that was no, the in the United Nations, 2000. 2017, that was uh, the new slogan that was entered. And as we all know, yeah, CV is now prevent and CV, CV. So what, uh, uh, what, what precisely has been achieved in that direction, cons considering that there is no definition? I mean, this is the big uh, demon. In so I think we're, we're down to 10 minutes in our <laughs> two questions. Let's just address. Uh, these questions first. Dina, you've got a lot of questions that have come your way. Uh, so maybe you want to take that, and then we'll get to uh, Saad Mosseni and David. Okay. I'm going to ask for a raise after this panel. But <laughs> um, so I very, I, I very much appreciate your question, because I think, um, I think for us, there, is, there has been a learning curve. There, uh, there is no question around the fact that it took us way too long to, and I'll address the, the, the Burma point first. It just took us way too, too long to wise up to what was going on. I think we, we really, that was a, an area where 
had we known what we know now, we would have been better. But at that point in time, we did not do well enough. And I think we have been trying to put in place mechanisms that would help us learn more how to respond in that in that arena. But with Burma, we we did not we did not get it right, and we didn't hear until later. Um, what we've been doing since then is we've been trying to listen to civil society more. We've we've took action against effectively our first members of a of a state in that because of Burma, and so that was a new a completely novel step for I think almost any tech company at our scale. So that was another step that we took. But I want to reiterate that for that sphere, that is one of the areas that we really that was a lesson that we learned and we're trying to we're trying to rev up from that. I can't even fully say that we are perfect at this point. So that's in no way this, the case, but if there are more civil society actors that we can engage with that you think we need to listen to, please, please let me know because that would be something that I would really appreciate. Um, when it comes to your regulatory question, I would say, actually, we're not opposed to it. If anything, we're open to regulation. I, at this point, as somebody who comes from a background of looking at how do you how do you write these rules, you don't want the tech company in and of itself to be writing these definitions. You don't want it to be creating these things in a silo. So we're open to regulation. I just think it's important for us to be open to smart regulation, regulation that is backed up by evidence, evidence and, and has um, rigor behind the way that it's implemented. The other portion of regulation that I think is really important to highlight here is Regulation needs to be up to speed with what's happening on the online platforms, right? It can't be that regulation takes many, many years to come to fruition, and then you've seen that the landscape is now completely and utterly shifted again. So that's one of the things that we actually, one of the papers that came out of the Global Internet Forum to Counterterrorism's research group is a paper that looks at where are the lessons that we can learn from regulation in other spheres? So can we learn a lesson from the financial sector's regulation patterns? So I would, I would definitely say flag that to you. Um, as long as it's smart regulation, I think we're, we're ready and we're, we're open to that. Um, I think On those AI are all of and the, um, You won't and let the me, you factors. won't let me pass it. You just <laughs> won't let me pass it, okay. So I think your question was around machine learning. Um, and artificial intelligence. So we do use it within the terrorism sphere, you're very right. For us at Facebook, um, I can speak on our behalf, we use the hash sharing database and the, the digital fingerprint for the GIFCT to share that knowledge, but internally we do a lot as well. So we have a machine learning mechanism that will look at content and see if it is a match. So if you have a match to known terrorist propaganda, it will trigger a takedown. If there's nothing around that, if, it's, if you just shared an al-Baghdadi video, that's just going to come down because the machine learning will say, okay, I saw a, a Baghdadi video that matched what I have in my content, there's nothing around it, so it'll come down. But where the learning comes in is that if you share an al-Baghdadi video, and like me, you were a former academic and you write about Okay, well, his image has changed. He's gotten a little fatter. Does that mean that he's staying? He's he's in an area where he can get access to food or uh, information that is context contextual. Then that automatically triggers a human review. So that will then say, okay, this could be condemning. You could be sharing it because you're condemning it. You could be sharing it as news. You could be sharing it as an academic. So that will then trigger human review on that part. Beyond that, we also do, we're working on things like uh, classifiers that look at text, right? It was very, very hard for us at the beginning. Um, we saw a lot of people taking photos of text. So it wasn't actually purely text, we couldn't decode that. So we're trying to train the machines to, you can read within a picture. Um, that kind of work is, is ongoing and I'm happy to touch base if you'd wanna hear more. Hopefully that answered the question. Still asking for Saad a raise. Saad the, the question to you about leadership and leaders yeah, turning demagogues. I think demagogues. It's, a, it's a valid question, and you're right, sir, that in countries like Hungary or whether it's in Poland and the U.S. and so many other countries where populists have taken over, the leadership is lacking, the political leadership. But that doesn't stop the business community, civil society, the media, and others to come out and to 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 actually change the narrative or change or at least. View an alter, you know, uh, offer an alternative uh, series of policies. But what's also important, I think, is, and we've, you know, I grew up in Australia. One of the reasons we always, we think and we believe, and I hope we're right, that 
we will never see Australia being taken over by a populist is the fact that you know, voting is compulsory. So where Facebook and others can help is full participation in elections because in a lot of these countries, even in the US, um, a populist leader emerged with far less votes um, than his opposition. So if we see, as a matter of fact, Facebook played a negative role in terms of dissuading a lot of minorities from coming out and voting, which could have cost uh, uh, the elections uh, for, for Hillary Clinton. So I think this is where people like us and, and Facebook can, can, and other media outlets, in particular in Europe and the, in the Western countries, can promote uh, you know, the, 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 the act of voting. Right, okay. Um, and the last question to you, David, on prevent, preventing and countering violent extremism, not prevent, which is <laughs> contest and prevent in the UK. Yeah, well, I'll, I'll try and be brief to see if we can squeeze in another question. But yeah, I think um, without wanting to labor the UN uh, CT architecture, which is not interesting even if you work within it, um, <laughs> broadly speaking, the UN Office of Counterterrorism, which is the new body that was created in 2017, is a general assembly body, but its role is to coordinate all of the UN CT efforts, whereas our body is a Security Council body, and our role is to do the assessment of member states' implementation of resolutions. So what are member states doing in terms of counterterrorism practice? We make assessments, we make recommendations of areas where they might need more support, and then we pass that package over to the Office of Counterterrorism for them to develop capacity building projects. So that's the model. Uh, Office of Counterterrorism are, are incredibly well resourced and are um, recruiting extensively at the moment. And so I would say probably since 2017, there's a le less pessimism in terms of the impact that they're having. I think the, the differentiation between prevention of violent extremism and counting violent extremism is again one of these terminology issues that uh, the UN spends a lot of time focused on. Um, so we view it as countering violent extremism, most of the rest of the UN system views it as PVE. Um, and I think broadly speaking, the reason for that is that it allows parts of the UN system that are not CT actors, for example, the UN Development Programme, to engage in programmes that are more societal and more uh, less targeted on an at-risk group, but will allow other parts of the UN system to to deliver programs that might have a broader kind of prevention aspect to it, whereas I think the CV programs we focus on are a little bit more uh, closely tied to CT policy, but that's a, a very quick answer. Thank I'm happy you. to talk. Um, we have only four minutes left. I want to take two more questions on the hands that I'd seen up first, one here on this front table, and there was one more in the back, I think, that I'd seen. So we're just going to come to these. and. There's a little bit of a coffee break after this. The panelists are around, the participants are around, so feel free to have these conversations outside as well. If you could keep your questions brief and tell us who you want to ask it to. Well, I'm Sanjeev Tripathi, retired civil servant with intelligence background. Uh, my first question is to Mr. Saad. Uh, well, it is now generally accepted, and Mr. Saad, you also mentioned that this uh, extreme radical Islamic extremism or violence cannot be countered only by through military means. It has to be countered at the ideological level as well. Now my question is that how do you think that it can be countered both on social media as well as on the ground, keeping in mind that it is a religion-based ideology and any interference by non-Muslims, whether states or individuals, trying to define what Islam should stand for could be counterproductive. Now, my second question is, uh, it has been mentioned about the ultra-right ideology also. Yes, it is there, and uh, sessions made, they need to be declared terrorists also. I fully endorse that. But don't you think that there is a difference between radical Islamic ideology and the ultra-rightist ideology, uh, whereas the former the, could, is proactive and has global agenda, the second one is more reactive and has localized agenda. Your comments on that. Um, and one more question uh, there, yeah. We'll take them together. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Maya. I had four questions. I'm reducing it to two and a quick comment. One well, is that I think the- If you could reduce it to one, that'll be even I'll better. I'll reduce it to one as well. No <laughs> okay, problem. I thanks. can carry the conversation ahead. I think I'll pose that one question to Dina. Uh, it's heartening to hear the steps that you mentioned here with regard to local news, with regard to what you're doing for crisis response. Does Facebook have an end goal to all the steps that you're taking? Do you have a goal in mind? Or do you know that an ideal goal of eliminating all such problems on Facebook doesn't exist, therefore what? Is there an end goal you're working towards? And my last quick comment is just this. 
while the platform may exist and may not create the problem in itself, we can't avoid the fact that the platform also legitimizes. And therefore, it's very important to regulate. But if you regulate, you can't just do that across the board. You, you can't regulate extremism because you're finding it difficult to define, but you can certainly regulate anything that leads to violence. So instead of focusing on extremism, if we focus on what leads to violence, and maybe technology can play a role there, all those things that you think that lead to violence, specific examples, then you may have a database to figure out where is the correlation that leads to violence, and then maybe regulate that. Thank you. Right. Um, so we'll do it in this order. Saad, you can take the question addressed mm -hmm. to you, and Matteo, maybe you can take the one on the far right and the Islamist uh, ideology, and then Dina, we'll close it with. In the 10 seconds, <laughs> we'll do that all. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, wh whether is Islam is, a, is, a, is an important question, and uh, that debate's ongoing in the Muslim world. Since 16 years ago, when we first launched in Afghanistan, it's quite, quite amazing how the debate has taken shape, and things that you couldn't have uttered uh, you know, 10, 15 years ago, you can freely debate now. So I think that is shifting. It's going to take a lot more time. But I just wanted to point out, most people attracted to radical Islam in Europe and Australia and those sorts of places are people who are not exactly Islamic scholars. They tend to be thugs, thieves, pimps, drug dealers. Um, and for them, it's more about you know, being relevant uh, and being something. It's more about uh, identity than anything else. It's quite, quite interesting. It's not, it's, they're not ideologues per se. They're more opportunistic. However, that debate in terms of what it's Islam means, that's an ongoing debate. I think we've shifted in the right direction, but it's going to take a lot longer. Right. Matteo? Well, yeah, of course, uh, um, jihadism, far right, extremism are very different phenomena, but uh, they have in common are some internal processes and CV policies and compasses. Uh, I think three large families of, uh, of action, general preventive measures, um, let's say outreach and engagement to establish relations with different stakeholders and individual interventions. I think that uh, many more states should implement not just community targeted approaches, uh, I mean for intelligence gathering and uh, law enforcement activities, but also um, community oriented approaches to work with the communities on that. Right, okay, thank you. I'm, I'm, I don't know if these answer your questions, but there'll be more panels in the course of uh, the day today and tomorrow that will possibly shed uh, greater light uh, on uh, these, these issues because we're going into really granular detail as the day progresses. Dina, we'll leave the last word to you. I also thought I was gonna get out of that. <laughs> um, so I, the end goal, I. Thank you again for the question. The end goal for us is to create the safest environment for the users that we can, for our community, to, to, to have the community be um, as safe for the people on Facebook as possible. Now, is it, is it our goal to eliminate all forms of extremism and terrorism on the platform? I, it's not. That's, that's not, I'm trying to set goals that are achievable so that I can have, um, that I can, so that we can take actions that are concrete. If I told you I'm going to eradicate terrorism on Facebook for in five years, you wouldn't believe me. And I wouldn't have the support of a team that is as active and as engaged as they are. I think one of our goals is to input as much friction between our platform and the abusive actors on it as possible to keep that community safe. Now, how that's gonna manifest, that it's an ever evolving a dance between us and the and and abusive actors on our platform. It's a it's a sphere that's constantly changing. So our goal is to also keep up with that. So keep up with the with the ever evolving threat that we're seeing on the platform and keeping that community safe. Now on the second part of your question, where the regulation is of um, of what leads to violence. Again, I would be very very careful in how we would define that. Not to not to hammer home just the the question of definitions, but what a uh, Western country that has uh, the, an infrastructure of solid democracy is going to define as a potential cause for violence is going to be completely different from some of the countries it, that maybe define terrorist actors as their political opponents. So again, the question needs to be posed. Um, 
who do we want to define what could lead to violence? Because that's a slippery slope. Is, is speech, is hate speech leading to violence? Is uncomfortable speech something that we have to take down? So I do agree with you, if you are instigating violence, that comes down. If you are presenting an imminent threat, that will come down. But when it comes to something that is a slippery th slope, I think we definitely should be having those conversations. But I think the decision factor and the decisive aspect of this should be backed up by academic rigor and backed up by research. So that's where I throw it to you, Maya. It's right. all thank, on you now. Thank you all. You've been a wonderful panel. I think there's lots of food for, for thought in this conversation.